It's time for Health Futures with Cypress Home Care Solutions, Bob Roth. This is Arizona's only show dedicated to providing you with expert advice on how to live a longer, healthier, and happier life. To learn more, call 602-264-8009. That's 602-264-8009. Now, here's your host, Bob Watt. Good afternoon. You're listening to Health Futures Taking Stock in You. And if you just tuning in for the very first time, our show is about how our older adult population can live a healthier, happier life. And how do we do that? We do that by bringing an extraordinary guest to our show. We're coming at you live from the Scottsdale Oil Park. It is Friday, February 21st, 2020. Hard to believe uh, we are one week past Valentine's Day. And I only bring that up because today we're going to talk about hearts. And I am pleased to have a repeat guest here in my studio. I've got Dr. Barry Freeman. He is the Senior Medical Director over at Optum Care Arizona. And Barry, you've been on the show before, but welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. It's good to have you back. It really is. And, you know, I, for our listeners, uh, you know, some of you may know this, some of you may not if you're listening for the very first time. Heart disease is something that runs in my family. And I lost my mother at a very, very young age at 66 years old. Uh, this year, she'll be gone 18 years. Uh, it's hard to believe that she's been gone that long. And unfortunately, she had a sick heart, um, lived uh, in a generation that, you know, basically had a very different lifestyle than we have today. And she smoked cigarettes at a young age and she didn't eat very well. And all of that caught up to her. And um, un- unfortunately, she had a short life. And my father has been dealing with heart disease as well. Uh, fortun- fortunately, um, thanks to modern technology, he has a stent in him. He had a TAVR, so he had uh, his aortic valve replaced. He's also got this thing called a watchman. Maybe we can talk about some of these things. But it's it's amazing just the innovation and technologies that have gone into cardiac care. So, you know, I, I often think if mom had lived long enough, she may have been able to receive some of that innovation and technology, and she could still be here with us. But the breakthroughs are just phenomenal. But... I will say this, the number one cause of death in this country, coronary disease, heart attacks, right? That's absolutely correct. One out of four adults today dies from heart disease. One out of four. Wow. All right. So here we are. It is, uh, you know, Heart Awareness Month. I bring up Valentine's last Friday. The Friday before was Red Day. Um, I did a show here. I didn't do it on hearts, but I made sure I wore my red. Um, we're trying to draw awareness to this and, you know, I wanted to really turn the microphone over to you, Barry, and, and really talk about what you see and what Optum Care Arizona is doing. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Happy to talk about heart disease. So heart disease, as I mentioned, remains the, uh, uh, the most common cause of death for adults in the United States. Uh, approximately one out of four adults will die from a heart attack. Um, it's important to differentiate heart attack from cardiac arrest. They're a little bit different. Uh, and that accounts for about 650,000 Americans each year dying from heart disease. And while there are certain risk factors such as hereditary or age that you really can't do anything about, there are so many things that are modifiable. And by modifying the risk factors, we can certainly help to reduce the risk of having a heart attack or at least delay its onset to later. And, and it's amazing to me. And, you know, Pardon me for jumping all over this. But, you know, we talk about innovation and technology. And I saw a story the other day on this kid who was wearing one of the newer Apple Watches. And he was a, he was a student athlete in high school. He was like 16 years old. And all of a sudden, his watch started sending him signals that he was having a heart issue. And his beats were up to 180 beats. And he wasn't exercising. Long story short, less than 24 hours later, he, w- he had an operation, an eight-hour operation to fix his heart. And it's amazing that, you know, I talk about innovation and technology. I mean, this is, this is an athlete. He was a three-sport athlete in his high school, and he wasn't even performing athletics. He was in the classroom. And innovation technology saved this kid's life. 
It's a great story. You know, it's all too common that we do hear about high school athletes that suddenly will die on the playing field or, or in the classroom. And, and you ask your question, why? How, how wasn't this discovered earlier? And what could we have done about it had we discovered it? And you're right, with new technology, and if we find these conditions earlier, we can really change uh, the impact on somebody's life going forward. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, For some of us old-timers, we remember Hank Gathers. Uh, Hank Gathers was the uh, the athlete that that you know played college basketball, and, and we all actually saw him literally die on the go- on, on the basketball court. And you know these are, these guys are elite athletes, and you know even being in shape doesn't mean that you are you know you 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 are not at risk, and you certainly are at risk. And you know you mentioned it as we kicked off our show. You know some of us have genetically you know been dealt a really bad hand and and if we don't get our ch- hearts checked we won't know that that's correct so what is your recommendation for most people in terms of getting their hearts checked i mean you know obviously we we need to go to our primary care physician i mean we, we should go get a physical at least once a year correct that sounds great and and uh when we go and and my primary care, phys- care physician when i go in for it he does an ekg on me and, uh, you know, I don't know if that's st- standard normal practice, but, uh, you know, he hooks up the leads and, and does that. And I, I do see a cardiologist as well because I have family history and I want to make sure that uh, everything is copacetic, if you know what I mean. I, I know what you mean. Well, you know, talking about EKGs, it, it, it is a good tool. I mean, it works best if you're having chest pain while you have an EKG. Uh, but a resting EKG can provide some valuable information. But more importantly, just educating yourself as to what are the risk factors for having a heart attack, what are the signs and symptoms, this is probably the best way to help protect yourself from having that premature heart attack that, you know, again, kills one out of four adults. Uh, and, and many of these, you know, you think, do you need to see a doctor? Well, you know, if you're overweight, you don't need a doctor to tell you that you're overweight. If you're not watching your diet, you don't need a doctor. If you don't exercise, you don't need a doctor to tell you that. But there are several things such as high blood pressure, or high cholesterol. These are absolutely things that you don't feel. You right. can feel great but have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and the only way you know you have it is by seeing your physician and if it is abnormal, having it treated properly. You know, and seeing your physician, making sure you get treatment, but you did say risk factors. And we know about genetic, but uh, I'm going to have to steer you in the direction to talk about some habits and, you know, off some of us have some really not so great habits. So, you know, what are some of the things that we can do to really help minimize the risk that we can still control, right? So I love that question. In <laughs> fact, it's such a great question because I just read this morning of an article published in the, the BMJ journal that talked about adults who initiate a healthy lifestyle in their 50s, later in their life. And what they found. So I, w- I want to just make sure our, our listeners, BMJ. Brit- it used to be known as the British Medical Journal. Okay. And then it has changed its name to the BMJ. Okay. Uh, I still know it as the British Medical Journal, though. Perfect. And what did it say? It said that uh, they, they reviewed a Harvard study, reviewed approximately uh, a half a million p- people uh, in their 50s who adopted a healthy lifestyle after years of not really having a healthy lifestyle. And what they found is that women could extend their disease-free life or disease-free status by as many as 10 years, and males who adopt a healthy lifestyle in their 50s can uh, extend their disease-free lifestyle uh, by about seven years. So, you know, just like flu shots, it's never too late to get a flu shot. Well, when it comes to heart disease, it's never too late to adopt a healthy lifestyle. Nice. It's, you know, it's encouraging because I'm still in my 50s, so I, 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 I have a chance here. I, I do live a pretty healthy lifestyle. I mean, for our listeners, you guys have had a chance to hear my wife, Susie, who is a fitness fanatic. She's a personal trainer, runs a boot camp, and eats really well. So she definitely has a positive influence on me. But there's certainly some other things that I could do to live that healthier lifestyle. But it's encouraging to know, Barry, that BMJ says that we could adopt this a little later in life and extend our lives as males as much as seven years and females another 10 years. That's correct. So it is encouraging. Well, the music's on. As you know, that signals the first segment is done. But you know what I want to talk about in the second segment? I want to talk about women and specifically about women's hearts. 
because we think of it really being a man's disease, and it's far more than that for women. So let's talk about that in the second segment, if we will. Sounds great. It's a great topic. All right. Well, you've been listening to Health Futures Taking Stock, and you, I'm your host, Bob Roth. I've got Dr. Barry Freeman. He's the Senior Medical Director from Optum Care Arizona. Stick around. We'll be right back. Now back to Health Futures, taking stock in you. If you have questions about your own or your loved one's future health care, call 602-264-8009. Now, here's your host, Cypress Home Care Solutions, Bob Roth. Welcome back. You're listening to Health Futures, taking stock in you. And if you're just tuning in, we're in segment number two. I've got Dr. Barry Friedman. He is the senior medical director over at Optum Care Arizona. He's a repeat guest on the studio here, and we're talking about hearts. You know, we're in the month of February. February's heart month. It's heart awareness month. Uh, it is Valentine's Day. It's Red Day on the 7th, Valentine's Day on the 14th. And here on the 21st, we're talking about hearts still because hearts are the number one leading cause of death. You said how many, how many people are dying every year? About 650,000 Americans. 650,000. And, you know, Barry, I, I, I told you I wanted to share some information with you. So in the U.S., more women than men have died from heart disease and stroke since 1985. One out of every three women are at risk of developing heart disease, with the trend approaching one of every two. Are you blown away by that statistic? Because I am. You know, it's an amazing statistic, that's for sure, because we always think of heart disease as a man's illness. We do. But the reality is, it's a woman's problem. You know, it's it's interesting because, you know, when you really think about it, women, you don't think of them as clutching their chest. And you think of men, you know, you know just grabbing at their chest saying, you know, I, I, I think a red fox from Sanford and Son, I'm really dating myself. Elizabeth, I'm coming to get you. You know, I mean, it's... But women have very different symptoms than men do, too. That's what I understand. Right. So most women, when they're having a heart attack or angina, uh, will have chest pain. But not all women will have chest pain. So typical signs or symptoms of a heart attack might include chest pain, oftentimes on the left side, pain radiating down the left arm or up into the neck. There could be shortness of breath. There can be diaphoresis or sweating. There can be weakness associated but what, what people oftentimes don't realize is that women oftentimes don't have your typical chest pain radiating down the left arm. They may have a, a dull discomfort in their chest. They may feel a sense of shortness of breath or doom. They may feel uh, weak or lightheaded. And these are all signs or symptoms in a woman that uh, attention is necessary. Right. And, and, you know, when you really think about it, women and God bless them. I, my, I'm surrounded by women. I have three daughters. I have a beautiful wife that I've been married to for 30 years. I work with women, and I have a dog that's a woman or, or a female. And, you know, they are literally their superheroes when you think about it. I mean, what they can do, you know, many of them work. They keep up the house. They take care of the kids. Um, they're always multitasking, and they think of people other than themselves. It's almost like nurses and doctors, right? They don't think of that themselves. They think of others, and, and that's the problem. I, I would see that as a problem. I would see that, you know, easy for me to say, oh, I feel fatigued, or I've, I've not been sleeping, or I, I'm nauseous, I've got back pain, my jaw hurts. Those are all signs that you could have a cardiac issue. Correct. Absolutely, they are. And it goes further. Although things are getting better, you know, in the old days, if a woman would present to an emergency room with the exact same symptoms as a male, chest pain radiating down the left arm, for reasons which are not clear, the physician would take the male symptoms as being more serious than the woman's symptoms. And that's wrong, which means there are women potentially being sent home from the emergency room that may have heart conditions that aren't being addressed properly. And women... They may feel the same way. They're really in tune with the traditional signs or symptoms of having a heart attack so that when they have a a jaw discomfort, they'll often attribute it to something different. So there are a lot of biases built into the system that are not necessarily working uh, in the favor of, of women nowadays. But things are getting better. I think that 
we are beginning to talk more and more about women having heart attacks. In fact, more women having heart attacks oftentimes than men. And uh, we're getting better. Well, it's interesting. Um, I A few years back, I had Dr. Martha Galati. I don't know if you know uh, Dr. Galati, but she's head of cardiology for Banner. And she was talking about that, you know, they didn't really start tracking gender specific till like the late 90s. I mean, they just, you know, grouped everyone together. So they're just starting to get some real data now as it relates to the differences between men and women who are suffering from heart attack. And one of the things that she did say was more women die in the first year after their first initial heart attack than men do. And, you know, I, I, I don't recall exactly a reason behind it, but I'm sure it's because so many women wait so long because they don't think of themselves first. They think of their spouses. They think of their children. They think of their jobs and careers. And they're never really thinking of themselves. And we need women to wake up because we need you. We really do. We, we don't want them to die of cardiac disease. So, uh, you know, I, I wanted just to cover that off and just say, you know, look, we need to be mindful. It's an equal opportunity offender. It goes after men. It goes after women. But it's the number one killer of people today. That's correct. So you you did talk about, you know, in the first segment, you talked about the risk factors. And, you know, we, we, we had to delve into the, uh, the, the genetic stuff, but we also talked about some of the stuff that you could st- keep away from. And certainly, you know, eating healthier is definitely one. Uh, you know, keeping your cholesterol down, uh, blood pressure down, not smoking, not eating fatty foods, and really moving, uh, not being sedentary. It's amazing how much we've learned today that you know, moving is so important for us to live healthier, happier lives. We weren't made to be sitting down like we are today. Yeah, Bob. So you know, smoking is, of course, a, a major risk factor for heart disease. And without question, the single most important thing a man or a woman can do to reduce the risk of having a heart attack is quit smoking. Easier said than done, but still, the truth is the same. It is the major cause of heart disease, and smoking will help to reduce your risk almost immediately. Uh, After that, you look at exercise. And exercise is probably either equal to or just right behind smoking in terms of of a risk factor. Uh, Exercising three to five times a week, 30 minutes, doing some kind of aerobic type activity will absolutely reduce your risk of having a heart attack. Yeah, you know, of course, you want to check with your physician before you start an exercise program to make sure that you're actually healthy and well enough to exercise. But once you get the green light from your physician, please start exercising. And you don't need a gym membership. I mean, just go for a brisk walk outside is all you need to do. Uh, Certainly great idea. You know, diet and exercise. Well, diet. Yeah. I mean, is there a special diet that may be of value? You know, there's a lot of emphasis put on what's called the Mediterranean diet right now, which is a wonderful, wonderful diet. But, you know, it, it's not a magical diet, it, 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 and it's not a diet that's very complex. I mean, plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, lean cuts of meat, lots of fish. I mean, these are all things that most people would associate with a healthy diet, and that's what the Mediterranean is. Red wine? Red wine is okay in moderation. Yeah, I, that's what they tell me, moderation, one or two glasses. But I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. And I, I'll eat the beans and the other stuff that goes in the Mediterranean diet. No, all really important stuff that you're sharing, smoking, diet, exercise. You know, one of the things that I did um, and I've shared with our listeners in the past is I, I was challenged with sleep, uh, big time challenged with sleep. I was only averaging about four and a half hours sleep and it was very interrupted. And what I discovered was I suffered from three ailments. One, I had a 90% blockage in my left side of my septum. Um, I had tonsils that were the size of marbles. And I had a uvula that was actually touching the bottom of my tongue. So I had a huge obstruction. So I was suffering from sleep apnea. And um, I went in for the trifecta. I went and got a septoplasty. I got a tonsillectomy. And I got my uvula removed. And I'm here today to tell you, last night I probably got six and a half, seven hours. I felt really good. Um, Getting much better sleep than I ever have gotten. And um, I bring that up because not enough people talk about how important sleep is and the effects of lack of sleep and what it does to your heart. And for me, because I have family history, I wanted to make sure that I could eliminate one of those symptoms that could be causing a cardiac issue. Yeah, so there is evidence that, that poor sleep quality or quantity does increase your risk of having a heart attack or stroke even. 
Uh, the mechanism is not necessarily clear, although there is some evidence that it impacts and increases your blood pressure. Uh, there, it may be associated with a lifestyle that's full with risk, a uh, uh, stress, I should say, and maybe uh, an unhealthy lifestyle altogether. Certainly, obesity is a risk factor for obstructive sleep sure. apnea. Sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, for me, you know, you know me. I mean, I don't look obese, but, I mean, there are people that are thin that have sleep issues, too. I mean, they have obstruction of that airway. And, uh, you know, you, you have to be able to take care of those things. And like you talked about before, eating healthier, even in your 50s, you can extend your life by a male can extend their life by as much as seven years, a female by 10. Not necessarily extend your life, but have uh, more time disease free, disease free, disease free, not extending. OK, disease free. Well, I'll, I'll go with that. But I'm thinking extending. <laughs> I like both. OK, if the quality is better, I'm all game. I am, too. I am, too. So what I want to talk about in the next third segment is, you know, we talk about cholesterol and we talk about LDLs and HDLs. And, you know, for me, I always get confused and I know our listeners probably get confused, too. So I want to really do a deeper dive into cholesterol and, and why having lower cholesterol is really important. And that's something through science that we're able to do. So I want to pick up on that and talk about that. You know, Barry, it's hard to believe. We've got music coming in. We're coming up on halftime here at Health Futures. You've been listening to Health Futures. I'm your host, Bob Roth. I got Dr. Barry Friedman. He's a senior medical director with Optum Care Arizona. Stick around. We're going to be talking hearts. And the third segment, we're going to talk a little bit about cholesterol. We'll be right back. Now, back to Health Futures, taking stock in you. If you have questions about your own or your loved one's future health care, call 602-264-8009. Now, here's your host, Cypress Home Care Solutions, Bob Roth. Welcome back. You're listening to Health Futures, taking stock in you. We're in our second half here at Money Radio Studios. Uh, we're coming at you live from the air park. It is Friday, February 21st. And if you're just tuning in, I have got Dr. Barry Freeman. He is the Senior Medical Director with Optum Care Arizona. And if you missed the first two segments, you want to go up to our website at cypresshomecare.com. The third button over is media. Click on the drop down and the third button down is radio show and you'll catch this program. You'll catch over 300 others we've been bringing to you for the last seven years. And, you know, it's really nice having you back on the show, Barry. And we're talking about something, you know, for our listeners that didn't hear us open the show. That's very near and dear to me. I lost my mother to a bad heart. I've got a father who, you know, we had on last Friday. Uh, He was on the show with me. Um, we had Dr. Serena Yoja on this, on the show. She's a podiatrist and, uh, we were wishing him a happy birthday. So he just celebrated 84 years. And even with the advent of technology and the fact that he's got a TAVR, which is a new aortic valve, he's got a stint and he's got a watchman in him. He's still kicking and being himself and he looks amazing and I should be so blessed to look so well. But at the same time, I want to make sure my ticker doesn't have those challenges that he's been dealing with. So uh, we talked a lot about in the first segment as well as the second segment. We talked about risks. We gave a lot of data and statistics about, you know, it, number one cause of death is heart disease. And we also talked about, um, you know, some of the other risks that you can control, and that is exercise and eating and and I did realize that, you know, I wasn't going to get seven more years of my life. I was hoping you were saying that. But you can, in your 50s, improve in these areas and add seven, for men, seven more years of quality life, disease-free, and better life, if you would, as well as women could add to another 10. So so that's optimistic. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm changing my, my risk factors, and I'm working on it. So one of the risk factors is high cholesterol. And when we finished our second segment, I said to Barry, I said, can you talk to our listeners and me 
the differences between LDL and HDL, and there are all kinds of testing that people are doing today. So um, I'm going to turn the mic over to you, Barry. So please explain to us LDLs, HDLs, and the whole cholesterol phenomenon. Happy to do so. So number one, you know, I can't look at a, a patient and tell what their cholesterol is just by looking at them. You can't feel what your cholesterol is by looking at them. Now, some of it is diet and exercise, some of it's genetic. So if you have a family history of high cholesterol, then you might have high cholesterol as well. If you're overweight and you're under exercise, you may have high cholesterol as well. But you can't tell. And the only way to know for sure is to see your provider and have your cholesterol checked. Now, you know, in the older days, we would check everybody's cholesterol and we recognized that high cholesterol was certainly associated with a higher risk of having a heart attack than low cholesterol. But they still noticed that there were some people that had low cholesterol that were having heart attacks, people that were having high cholesterol that weren't having heart attacks. And so they knew that there was something more than just knowing your cholesterol level. So they started to break it down. And it turns out that cholesterol is made up of different fractions, I'll say, different parts. There is good cholesterol, otherwise known as HDLs. And then there are bad cholesterols, LDL. LDL is the one that we really don't like. That's the one that likely results in atherosclerosis, uh, which is a cholesterol buildup within a coronary artery or any artery in the body. And, and, and cholesterol buildup. I mean, just, you know, if we can make it very layman, descript, uh, give a layman description to our audience, it's, it's plaque, right? It's plaque. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's that stuff, like the tartar we get on our teeth, it's plaque inside our, our arteries, right? Yeah. This, this is fat. This is fat it's that's fat. circulating throughout your bloodstream, and it's attaching itself to the walls of an artery. And when it attaches, it starts to build up and build up until ultimately it forms a plaque. And a plaque can cause a blockage. A blockage uh, can cause a heart attack. Or a blockage can suddenly rupture and result in a blockage that's 100% and creates a heart attack. So it's the LDLs that are the culprit in this plaque formation. Wow. And, and when, you know, now you got me thinking, okay, so I can do some changes in my 50s and change my eating habits and physical activities and have a better quality of life. What can we do to get rid of those plaques, right? I mean, if they start, I mean, can, we, can you flush them out? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking like a plumber, right? So you're thinking like a plumber, but there may be some truth to it. They have done some studies. Uh, where they looked at the carotid arteries, the arteries leading to the brain, and they were filled with plaque, and they started patients on a, a healthy lifestyle, including some medication management, like a statin, for example, and they repeated the x-rays, and they did actually show plaque regression. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, so this plaque that you're talking about, which is primarily formed by LDLs, it's not the HDLs. The HDLs are the good stuff. So primary, primarily formed by that. So it... it thickens the walls and narrows the, the, the blood flow, right? That's correct. And, and when a heart attack happens, it either completely gets blocked or maybe a piece falls off and, 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 and blocks. I mean, how does that all work? Both of them. So what can happen over time is that the blockage can slowly increase over time. Some people are lucky enough to form what's called collateral circulation, mm -hmm. which is sort of bypass blood vessels that go around the blockage. Uh, other people don't, and they may develop something called angina. When they exercise, walk upstairs, they'll have chest pain. And then there are those people that develop these blockages that get to 40, 50 percent blockage, not really causing any symptoms. And then for reasons which are not entirely clear, the plaque may suddenly rupture. And when it ruptures, that 50 percent blockage goes to 100 percent blockage Whoa. immediately. And that results in a acute myocardial infarction, um, which is a heart attack. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. So uh, you, it's important to know your numbers. It's important to know your numbers, and, and it's and, important to treat the condition as well. Right. So knowing your numbers is important, and the only way you know your numbers is going in to see your PCP. That's correct. Interesting. So I share a lot of my health with our listeners, and you know, because I have family history, um, I take a statin. Um, not, my cholesterol is not really that high, but I take five milligrams a day sometimes every other day but i mean to keep my numbers down because i have family history is that something you subscribe to you know you talked about genetics you talked about history is part of the the symptoms that one could have i mean one way to stave it off is doing stuff prophylactically like that right right so taking a statin has been shown uh, to help reduce your risk of having a heart attack in fact some statins have been shown 
uh, that combined with the diet and exercise program, a healthy lifestyle, it can reduce your risk of having that heart attack by as much as 25, 30%. So these are really powerful uh, pieces within a, within a health style modification program. Uh, taking a pill by itself does help. Combine that pill with a healthy lifestyle, and then you're starting to get the full benefits of the intervention. So, yeah. Perfect. And, all right, so we've, we've talked about some of the things that we can work on improving, and some of them are notes to self. You know, I, I'm, I'm taking note. But one of the ones that we haven't really talked a lot about, and we'll talk about it here at the end of the third segment. We may kick off the fourth and talk a little bit more about it. Stress. How big a factor is that? Stress is a factor. Stress is a factor in that in itself – can have a toxic effect upon the heart, but also it could also create a unhealthy lifestyle, and a lifestyle that could result in over drinking, uh, overeating, under exercising, poor sleep quality, which can also increase your risk of having both a heart attack or stroke. So stress is something that we need to deal with. So, you know, if you feel you're someone under a lot of stress, figure out ways to sort of reduce it. Talk to people about the things that are stressing out. Share your feelings, and these are all. St- Uh, strategies that have been shown to to help people cope with stress if they can't eliminate stress from their life. Well, it's it's interesting. We have one-third of our population today, Barry, 65 and older, lives home alone. Uh, Dr. Joseph Coughlin from the MIT Age Lab predicts in the next 10 to 20 years that number is going to approach 50, if not go over 50%. It's got to be incredibly stressful to be home alone and not have a partner to really share your life with. And one one of the solutions that you have talked about is exercise. And, you know, one of the things I want to talk about in our fourth segment is that you didn't mention your community centers. I think you have four now, right? We have four. We just opened up our new community center on uh, 12th Street and Glendale. Wow. 12th Street and Glendale. That was right down by where my office is. So I want to hear a little bit more about the community center because you can exercise there. You've got all kinds of programming there. And I found out, I think the last time you were here, maybe the time before, you actually don't have to be a member of Optum. Nope. Arizona, you, Optum you, Care, Arizona. You, you do not. You can you can come and work out, and you got Ben Brock, who's really put the best of the best of equipment in there. Go Ben! All right. Well, listen, we're up at a break here. Third segment down. One more to go. You've been listening to Health Futures, taking stock in you. I'm your host Bob Roth. I got Dr. Barry Friedman. He is the senior medical director with Optum Care, Arizona. We'll be right back. If you have questions about your own or your loved one's future health care, call 602-264-8009. Now, here's your host, Cypress Home Care Solutions, Bob Roth. Welcome back. You're listening to Health Futures, taking stock in you. I'm your host, Bob Roth. And if you just tuned in, I've got Dr. Barry Freeman here. He's a senior medical director with Optum Care Arizona. And we're talking hearts. Uh, we're just coming off a week ago, Valentine's Day, and February's Heart Health Month. And we are talking about how we can save lives. And saving lives is knowing your numbers. We talked about that last segment. We talked about LDLs, HDLs, cholesterol. We talked about risk factors and symptoms. We talked about family genetics, uh, all kinds of things to really improve your lifestyle and the life that you live. And we want to make heart disease no longer the number one cause of death. And the only way to do that is really being mindful of your, your life, your lifestyle, the way you live. Try to live stress-free. I mean, that's hard to do, but if you eliminate stress, you take care of the things that you can take care of for the most part, you can live a healthy, happy life, right, Barry? Yeah, you know, take control of your life. There's, there's uh, much that you can do to reduce your risk of, of, of dying prematurely, having heart attacks, et cetera. Well, exactly. And, and, you know, when we broke in the third segment, you know, I, I, I came back to Optum Care Arizona. You guys have these great community centers in our community. 
And exercise is something that we know we need to do more of, especially to help our, our hearts. Um, you can do that in your centers, right? Absolutely. So, you know, Optum Care Arizona is a, a network of primary care providers, specialist hospitals, nursing centers, all working together to allow our Medicare eligible members to live their healthiest lives. And without question, part of that is is exercise. Out of that part of that is community. And so we have four community centers spread out throughout the valley that are open to uh, any adult fifty five and older. Uh, where they can go and they can exercise for free under some supervision. Uh, there are several classes there that really help uh, people live a healthier life. Um, and there are wellness centers as well where, where seniors that are part of the Optum Care program can have an annual health assessment or annual wellness visit to learn more about their, about their own health and their risk factors. So how do we learn about that? I know you got this great website, Optum Care. And it's it's optumcare.com. Absolutely. And, yeah. and then just click on the Arizona button, right? That's right. So just go to optumcare.com, uh, click on the Arizona button. And for patients, there is a portal called the patient information. If you open that up, uh, you'll find information about uh, any topic you might choose uh, with uh, uh, regarding your health. So you, you can find out how to join and you can find out about these centers. Um, so Optum Care Arizona is a great place to go. And um, I, I, right here at about uh, wellness resources. Oh, wellness resources. There you go. Health and community wellness library, community centers, and there you go. There's the community centers locations. Fantastic. As you can probably tell, Barry and I are navigating together on this. So very cool. So we got one in Central Phoenix that he mentioned earlier. It's about 12th Street in Glendale. We got one in Chandler. They're on 985 West Chandler Heights Road. Got one in Deer Valley. That's right up there by John C. Lincoln. Uh, Honor Health now. That's right. Just a few blocks north. Yep. And then you got one out in Goodyear right there in Pebble Creek. Yeah, these which, are be- which, beautiful which centers. Is, which is a beautiful, beautiful community. So, um, you know, I, I like to do this with my guests and like to have somewhat of a lightning round and ask you just to quickly respond. So, you know, I'd love, you know, I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. So I hope you don't mind. But I'm going to throw a couple things at you, and I wanted to hear how you feel about them. Go for it. So, you know, these are some of the things that we hear a lot of right now, and it's much in the news. So let's talk about the very first one, the coronavirus. Yeah, super hot topic right now. You know, coronavirus originated in China. Uh, There have been 13 confirmed cases here in the United States, so um, it's not terribly prevalent right now. Uh, There have been a lot of deaths associated with the coronavirus back in China. So far, I don't believe there's been any deaths in the U.S. And, uh, you know, we're we're trying to get control. I think that the World Health Organization is out in China right now trying to better understand the virus. I know everybody's trying to work on a vaccine or a cure or just treatment. Uh, But while there's been a lot of publicity uh, the truth is we're in the heart of flu season right now, influenza A and B, and hopefully everybody now, by now has had their flu shot. But still, the flu is, without question, uh, a much more serious health-related problem in the United States right now than the coronavirus. Well, it's inter- interesting you mentioned that. So the flu this season between 2019 and 2020, and I don't know if you were startled by this number, but we've had 14,000 deaths in this country alone. Over a quarter million people have been hospitalized because of this flu. And you did give me some positive news about the uh, vaccination. Right, the vaccination. So everybody's concerned that the vaccination isn't going to work. Well, this year, the statistics are suggesting that it is 49% effective. Now, that's why not 100%. Why do they just say 50? I mean, come I on, we'll, we'll round up. We're going to say 50%. If we say 50, you won't necessarily believe it. 49 <laughs> is a more believable number. Uh, but, but compared to last year, we were only maybe at 35% effectiveness. But it just startles me that we lost 14,000 lives. And, and a quarter million people have been hospitalized. And I imagine the majority of them are people that we talk about, older adults and probably children are the ones that are going to the hospital. Yeah. You know, people who whose immune system is somewhat compromised. Yeah, well, definitely the older adults. And, and while, you know, we do, have a, we do have immunization, we do have a vaccine, you know, how many people this year did not have their flu shot? Now, some people say it's too late. I missed the opportunity. But the truth is, it's not too late. If you haven't had your flu shot, please go ahead and have one done as soon as possible. The sooner you get it, the quicker you'll develop an immunity. And hopefully, if you are exposed to the influenza virus, you will be better protected. So... Uh, Coronavirus, influenza virus, um, if you're traveling by plane, um, those, you know, I just was on an airplane last week and 
Uh, it's a long story, but we did get somewhat quarantined on the plane for about 25 minutes, and I thought I was going to be doing 14 days somewhere in, <laughs> in one of the uh, in, in one of the locations that they're quarantining people in. But uh, thank God we didn't. But is there you know besides universal precautions? I mean, do you recommend wearing a mask? If you're you know, traveling, I mean, is that a little too excessive at this point? You know, I, I think it depends on, on your health status. If you find that you do have a problem with your immunity, you have a lot of comorbidities, a lot of illnesses, your older age, there's certainly no harm in wearing a mask. But I think as, as a general recommendation, no, I think a mask is, is pretty much overkill. You're going to want to wear those N95 masks. N95, yep. And uh, I, from what I understand, there may actually... Uh, be uh, you know a lot of people they're they're in demand right now. Yeah, a little shortage there. Yeah, maybe. And we should be stockpiling them. Yeah. We could be selling them up on eBay or something. But like that. but I don't think the general public needs to start wearing masks at this point. All right. So opioids. Talk to me about opioids. I mean, you know, it's, it's always in the news, and you know, I, I I think doctors, and and I'm not indicting doctors because you are one. And I just want to say this. I think doctors over the past years and they've been somewhat over prescribing them and they certainly were getting direct direction from big pharma companies to do such but i don't think we've really done a good job of figuring out how to get people off of them and that's the biggest challenge we have no we certainly haven't done is uh, we haven't done everything we should be doing or could be doing you know when you think about opioids there's there's two kinds of classes there are those that are taking opioids off the street for recreational uses and uh, that's a challenge. It is. And, you know, that's becoming a leading cause uh, of death of teenagers. And so right. that's certainly a problem in itself. But, you know, the opioid epidemic is due to people that may have initially been prescribed opioids for what may have been legitimate reasons, pain. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, uh, the opioids were continued. They weren't weaned off. And uh, opioids, unfortunately, cause uh, tolerance. And ultimately, addiction and and require larger and larger dosages. And uh, I think that it puts a lot of our our adult people on opioids initially for appropriate reasons into peril. And that they are at risk for all sorts of complications, including death. Mm. And and it's it's really hard. I mean, you know, and like I said, I don't think we've done a good job. And I've read up on this in terms of how to get them all get off of them weaning off them is it's not like weaning off of some of the other medications i hope we we have some breakthroughs in this year and the next year to try to do what we can to get people off of these opioids so i got one last question for you it's oh. hard to believe we're ready to finish things up so my last question to you barry what comes to mind as the single most important area to address as we build better ways to age um Loneliness. You know, our, our, our seniors um, often are living alone. Right. They're I gave li- that stat. One third, yeah, 65 and it's, older. It's a huge number. And, and so they have depression. Depression causes sleep problems. Uh, they might have issues with access to appropriate food, so their diets are not necessarily appropriate. They may have issues with access to um, health care. And so I, I think that we need to develop a solution to how do we take care of seniors that are living alone and don't have access to all the things they need in order to stay healthy and well. I say they come to the Optum Care Community Center. It's a good we, place to start. We, we got four locations, and they'll greet you there. They'll welcome you, and we'll prevent loneliness, and we'll get you exercising, eating right, and living healthier, happier lives. Sounds great. Hey, Barry, it's great having you here on the show. Always a pleasure. To our listeners, if you need anything to know about Optum Care Arizona, go to OptumCare. Dot com. Click on Arizona. You can learn more. Thank you for being with us today. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Barry, great to have you on the show. Thank we'll be you. back next Friday. There's no place like home. You've been listening to Bob Roth's Health Futures. If you have questions about your own or your loved one's future health care, Call Cypress Home Care Solutions at 602-264-8009. That's 602-264-8009. Or visit cypresshomecare.com. Be sure to join Health Futures with Bob Roth every Friday at noon, right here on Money Radio 1510 and 105.3 FM.